Good morning. Um, my name is Martin Wilk, uh, and today I'm going to talk about journal control, so another systemd topic. Um, and before I start with the actual um, uh, topic of my talk, um, I'm going to follow up on a talk from last year. I uh, well, the title of my talk basically plagiarizes uh, Peter Mladic's talk from last year. Peter had talked about uh, print K um, and um, the, uh, the implementation of print K in the kernel and uh, had also um, talked about the problems with print K in the kernel at that time. Uh, in particular, the fact that print K might uh, lock up in certain situations, might lock up a thread or an interrupt handler when it calls print K, and there are at the same time many messages uh, being pushed into the kernel lock buffer more, so quick that uh, the slow, usually slow consoler cannot process them uh, fast enough, then the first caller is responsible for printing everything to the consoler. That means that this caller may stay there for a very long time uh, and, and uh, push data to the consoler. Uh, and get effectively stuck. Um, for that, uh, people from SUSE Labs, uh, Jan Kara and Peter, had uh, worked on uh, a patch um, which uh, came under the name of asynchronous print K, which would basically uh, introduce a separate kernel thread uh, dedicated to just to the job of flushing messages from the lock buffer to the consoler. Uh, that would, of course, avoid uh, threads blocking on, on the slow printing, uh, but uh, the patch hadn't been well received upstream. There, were, there was strong opposition, uh, in particular because people thought that that separate thread might not get scheduled in critical situations, uh, panic or sudden death scenarios, and would fail to print the messages that would, would be vital to see for uh, developers for analyzing uh, to the Solar. And so that patch uh, never made it really upstream. We had them, the, we had this patch in uh, slash 12, SP2, and 3. Um, but uh, this year, upstream got uh, its own solution, which we also now have in slash 15 and slash 12, SP4, too. Um, the patch was called print K, add console owner and waiter logic uh, to load balance console writes. And uh, well, the idea is um, that if one process is busy writing stuff to the consoler and then another process wants to push a message out, it sort of volunteers take, to take that over that job. Uh, by say, uh, well, it doesn't really volunteer, I think it has to, but so the, it takes over the job and the first thread can stop flushing stuff to the console, it can take it over its uh, ordinary work again, and then the second thread flushes until someone else comes and he takes so the, the console uh, log flushing is passed on from uh, one thread or one caller, let's put it that way, uh, to the other. And that means that no single thread uh, can be uh, hung in that flushing uh, work uh, for an indefinite time. So um, it, it does not prevent all theoretically possible scenarios, uh, but uh, lockup scenarios, but it has uh, been shown uh, to be helpful in the practical problems that had been seen so far. And, and it's deemed more reliable in those critical situations like um, panic situations and so on. So um, that's what became of the, the problem Peter uh, talked about in last year's talk. I mean, it, I told you about the, that much that I understood about it. If you have in-depth questions about that, uh, I would like you to ask Peter, uh, and not, my, not me. Um, uh, so he knows um, much more about it than me. But I thought it might be interesting <laughs> uh, to uh, follow up on that uh, from last year. Okay, um, now um, back to my original topic, which is more on the user space side. Um, the reason why I thought it might be interesting to talk about it here is that um, log analysis is an important part of the work for everyone who works with customer problems, Baxilla and so on. And it's a major pain point if log messages are missing for whatever reason. So that was also, yeah, so we had the, 
uh, question why kernel messages might be missing. And there are other uh, other things for log messages where they can lost also in user space. And it's particularly uh, unpleasant if you tell the customer, I enable this and that log option there and this and that, uh, and then he does and works on it and he gives you the logs and then you say, oh no, uh, the, the log message that I wanted has been lost for whatever reason. That's uh, usually uh, pretty um, embarrassing and not nice. So um, there are really, really plenty of different parameters and options that you can set uh, for enabling logging and uh, um, I listed a few here. Uh, we all know them, I think. Everybody has seen either each of these parameters, um, but um, at least for myself, I thought that there is, I still had some uh, un clear points and how do these uh, messages uh, interact, what process exactly looks at which option and, and so on, and what, what is really the best thing to do um, in order to avoid um, losing log messages. Um, and that's uh, what I want to do uh, today. I want to provide a little bit background or a better background picture maybe and uh, derive a few, few practical hints from that. Okay, so they start with the simplest part that's uh, everybody knows this probably. It's journal D Steam streams I, I, and IO sockets. I have this picture here. You will see it a lot during this talk. Um, so that it uh, summarizes the main actors in the message processing. We have the kernel there. We have the log buffer, which collects uh, kernel messages both from printk and through uh, devk msg. These message log buffer can be read or written. And we have the consoler, the print, where printk is flushing its messages, as I, uh, as we talked about at the beginning of the talk. And then we have a uh, journal D with uh, various, <coughs> in, sorry, various interfaces. Um, so let's start with the the output. Uh, just a short mention: you, the journal D has the forward to syslog option, which makes it forward uh, messages to an external uh, syslog daemon, such as our syslog. Um, then we have a uh, forward to consoler, uh, which uh, makes journal D forward some stuff to the consoler. And we have forward to KMSG, which makes uh, journal D print stuff to KMSG. That will be a topic later. Then on the other end, we have uh, input, of course, from, from KMSG. Um, then we have system D that starts various processes. Um, we have Classical daemons or other classical Unix stuff that uses syslog writes to the dev log socket, which journal D kind of stole from the classical R syslog and uh, took it over. Um, then we have um, modern or system journal D aware services, which uh, use the SD journal print K API. And then we have uh, like dump services, which simply print uh, to standard out. Um, and in case you have ever wondered how this works, so uh, systemd opens uh, a file a descriptor to the standard out socket of journal D and sends an initial message to that socket, where well, what service is it going to be, is it control groups on what day, time of day, whatever, a kind of metadata. And then uh, it simply starts uh, that service uh, with standard out, standard error connected to that so socket, to that file descriptor. So that journal D now has uh, can can capture the output and still knows uh, some additional information about the service it's logging. That enables uh, journal D to add uh, tags and uh, save the stuff in an structured way. Okay, uh, just a summary of what we just saw, the various sockets there. Uh, one thing you have to be aware of is the rate limiting that journal D applies. Uh, uh, so um, if more, message, more than 1,000 messages arrive in a th 30 seconds time interval by default, then that service will be throttled, the log messages will be throttled. It's quite a high limit, obviously, but sometimes uh, it's exceeded. So uh, then in this case, it's necessary to set this, these values to zero. Okay, then we have the various forwarders, mentioned them all except uh, wall, which, well, we know that it's for emergency messages printed to all terminals. <coughs> 
Okay, then uh, next is uh, the log targets of systemd, so BAD1 and the various other programs from systemd switch. So um, again, the same picture. Now we have systemd here, and um, it can log its own log messages to various uh, places. So we have this one, we have the console log target, we have the KMSG log target, we have the journal log target. And there are other daemons, oh sorry, no, not this one, yeah. We have uh, the, a different type of messages, which is not log messages, and they, they are called status messages, more about that later, which are only printed to the controller. Um, then we have other daemons from the systemd suite, like systemd user instances, or login d, or network d, uh, host name d, you name it. Uh, they all have the same approach to logging. And um, these have the same targets, so they, be, uh, they also evaluate the same command line options and environment variables as systemd itself. So they have the log journal log target, they have the console log target, they have the kmsg log target, and they have the syslog log target. So this one is a little special because systemd itself, if it's running as PID1, does not, cannot use it. That's for obvious reasons because uh, in that, at that time the rsyslog daemon is usually not running, so systemd can't use this, this log target. Okay, uh, summary of that. Uh, yeah, we have these basic types. Uh, console, KMSG, journal, and syslog, and it, the daemons always use only one at, at any time. So the message will only go to one of these targets. Um, and then there are these combined ones, such as journal or KMSG. I've been wondering for some time how it actually works. So the, this is how it works. It tries the journal, and if that doesn't work, for whatever reason, if an error is uh, returned, then it falls back to KMSG. But not forever. Usually it, uh, it retries to, when it receives an event that something has changed, it retries the journal and usually will we'll be able to switch back to the journal. I come back to that later. Then we have the possibility to configure the log targets. Um, and there's a, a hierarchy of uh, precedence. The first precedence is the daemon command line, then the environment variables, next is the proc command line, and finally the configuration, for example, in the systemd system conf. And it's kind of curious if you look at these options how the systemd developers uh, manage to have a different spelling, a different large, capital and small characters and every time. So just to make a easy, life easier for all of us to remember stuff easier, right? <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, uh, about status messages, I mentioned them already, so they, they are not log messages, they are sent to the consoler independent of logging seconds. So we have all seen them, it's this stuff like starting X, stopping, mounted, this, this stuff. And um, these messages, starting, stopping, are also in the logs, they are duplicated. But then there are others, uh, the notorious messages, which we all know if the system doesn't come up, it's like a start job is running for whatever, and repeating all the time, usually unreadable. Um, these are not duplicated to the logs, you won't find them there. And uh, well, they start like after a five, system, five second timeout if something doesn't work as expected. And it uh, switches on other status messages temporarily until that uh, uh, slow job finishes. If the command line parameter quiet is set, which is the default normally. So um, the, you can influence these messages with the command line parameters quiet and systemd dot show status, um, where quiet is not the same as systemd dot show status zero uh, because of what I just mentioned. So if you say if you uh, switch off the status messages with the show status uh, parameter, then uh, the the uh, start job is running for will still be displayed, but will, they will not activate uh, other messages. And then there's another thing, uh, these status messages can be enabled at runtime by sending a real-time signal to system D, and if that happens, uh, all the command line parameters mentioned above uh, will be uh, void. So the, the signal overrides uh, the, the parameters. 
Okay, one word, and that's in that context I need to mention Plymouth. Um, it does not have the best reputation here at SUSE. Um, well, I have a problem here. Uh, ah, okay. So this is uh, what Plymouth does. It uh, puts itself between the physical console and um, the, the, the log message writers uh, by redirecting the console to a pseudo terminal. And so it catches everything that is written to the console and um, depending on its own configuration, forwards it to the physical console and uh, or not. And later, when the boot uh, is finished, writes the stuff uh, to the file boot.log. So, um, so, and it also sends the mentioned real-time signal to systemd, which will cause which will cause systemd to write the status messages. Interesting, the, that happens when the splash is activated. So, you actually your screen goes dark, you get a funny picture, and at the same time, systemd is starting logging messages which you don't see, right? Um, so, yeah, that's what uh, Plymouth does. Um, it's actually not that bad, I think. For some applications, it's quite good because uh, it gives you that file varlog boot.log. Uh, at, at least in those cases where you are able to retrieve that file, it might be helpful sometimes. Um, yeah, then it, it sends the real-time signal to system D when it's showing the splash, not earlier. So that's usually five seconds after boot. I don't know why that is so, but uh, you may know it. When you start the system, you see some messages for some time, even in user space, and then you see the, the funny picture, which is five seconds after the start of, of Plymouth. And um, that means that uh, the messages, status messages from system D are only captured from that time on, so five seconds after boot, not earlier, by default. Um, so um, Plymouth again has options. Plymouth.enable equals zero is quite popular here at SUSE, I think. And it's all, uh, it is, of course, the best thing to do when you use a serial console and you don't want uh, uh, Plymouth to interfere in any way. Then uh, other interesting options are Plymouth.splash delay zero, which uh, avoids this problem with a five seconds delay. So you will see early messages from systemd or other uh, in varlog boot.log. And then splash.verbose, uh, okay, that will cause Plymouth to uh, forward everything to the f physical console. Of course, you can also hit the escape key, which has the same effect, but um, maybe at a later time during boot. Okay. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, uh, the latest um, method uh, for Plymouth haters uh, and for uh, mainframes uh, is to use blog and blog Plymouth. That um, yeah, bootlog daemon and uh, that writes uh, that uh, boots dot lock um, still. So um, if you use um, uh, Plymouth.enable equals zero, then you don't get that bootlock. And uh, customers usually want that bootlock, and especially on S390X, uh, they use that alternative. It's available since last 12 SP3. It's only S390. Um, there, there it's required, but you can use it for everything, for all CPU architectures. I also use it for my x86-64 machine. Okay, so it's quasi an alternative to, to the catch. Yeah, yeah. okay. Right. Ah, thanks. Um, one more option, great. <laughs> okay, here this slide is, seems, seems to be somehow... Uh, uh, ah, okay, um, this was, was supposed to be about um, what happens during boot. Um, oh, my time is running out here. So, something's wrong. Ah. Okay, um, system D, uh, when it starts, first starts, starts with a KMSG target, um, and um, need, it needs to con uh, figure out first how it is it's configured itself. So, um, and what during that time it locks to KMSG. Um, the configuration usually is to use the journal, which doesn't work at that time, so uh, it gives up on that, and um, switches back to KMSG, 
at the same time. And uh, that's the point where you will see this message something like system D running in system mode. Um, Okay, and then the system D goes on to a normal uh, operation, starts default to target, which means that journal D socket is started almost immediately because it's usually one of the first units to be started. And then system D gets a notification that journal D socket is up. And from that point on, uh, basically any write to a journal D socket will use the socket mechanism of system D to start journal D. And, and at the same time, the sysinit target, which comes pretty early, um, will also pull in the journal D service. That means that now from there, a uh, short time after that, uh, the journal D is uh, started. And, uh, but system D does not push journal D explicitly. So it, it relies on its normal uh, start mechanisms to start. Um, so, uh, journal D is started, uh, system D gets a message that uh, something has happened, checks the journal, and journal D itself starts by reading def k msg and flushing the contents to the journal, which is in tempfs at this point in time. Uh, so now the system D gets the message, checks the journal again, and at this point in time, it will stop logging to KMSG and switch over to journal D because the socket is now operational. Um, well, the status messages may go to the console, but that's um, then the root file system will pop up sooner or later if everything goes right. Um, and system D will notice that and start switching root which means that journal D is stopped again. So um, it, again, there is a notification, and journal, uh, system D closes the socket and switches to KMSG, back to KMSG. Now uh, the root switch happens, um, and uh, journal D uh, reappears very quickly after that because it has the properties restart always and restart second zero, so it will be we will immediately triggered. And, um, well, immediately means a few milliseconds or so some in, in uh, practice. And will open its sockets, it will find, all oh, depending on the configuration, it will now start to... Um, Ah, sorry, here, here system D is, gets another notification, switches back to the journal again. Um, in journal D, first thing it will do, if it's configured to do persistent uh, journaling, is uh, flushes its journal to a persistent storage. And uh, when it's done with that, it will again read messages from KMSG. And that takes some time, so uh, especially the flushing to persistent storage, because journal D is not a multi-threaded service. Um, it's busy with these with this stuff because actually receives new messages and that could, in theory, uh, cause messages to be lost if some uh, socket buffers overflow. But but I have never I haven't heard about that yet, so I don't know if it happens in practice. Um, Okay, so then uh, the FKMSG is flushed, and when that's done, um, the system is basically in fully operational. One thing that I want to mention uh, is uh, how messages can be lost in KMSG, and that is if journal D has the forward to KMSG option set. So in that case, it writes stuff to KMSG. System E also writes stuff to KMSG. So what happens there, we have a default rate limit by the kernel, enforced by the kernel, um, so that it only a, a, a pretty tough limit that, that messages in order, in order to avoid uh, user, spam, user space processes to spam the kernel lock buffer too quickly. Uh, that's one thing. And uh, well, the other thing is uh, the journal D reads back messages to, from KMSG. And now, how, how can we prevent that the messages go around in circles? Write to KMSG, read it back, write the stuff back, and, and so on. Uh, well, the, the solution is that the kernel, whenever it receives the message from user space, journal D or whatever else, it sets the log user bit, it sets the, the log um, RAM to user, and uh, journal D 
uh, when it reads back from KMSG, will skip everything that has the log user bit set. So no message that has been written from user space to the KMSG will be written back by journal D in this configuration. So it's, this is only if you have forward to KMSG active. And that means that also the messages written to uh, KMSG by system D itself and by M any other process uh, can be lost, are lost actually. And that may cause a message like this from journal D. I have seen that, it, uh, missed 1,042 messages, kernel messages. They weren't exact, actually from the kernel, these messages were not from the kernel, they were from system D. Um, because I had system D logging on. So, um, um, but, um, well, there is a, a running number, an ordinal number that journal D sees, and it, uh, because it discards everything that comes from user space, it sees like, well, the last message I had was like 10,000, and now the one I have is 10,201. And uh, I missed 2,000 messages. Um, and these were not missed because of resource uh, shortage, but because uh, it just doesn't read uh, user space messages back which is the right thing to do, but it, it's still bad in some situations. Um, okay, you know, this means that uh, the system DK message log target is basically ineffective in this setup. Okay, the KMSG catch 22, what is the time? Oh. So uh, basically don't use that option, it's, it's really evil. I don't, don't see any, any good use for it. Um, uh, also, I would advise against systemd log target k equal carry msg. It will cause every systemd message to go through the kernel log buffer with no level filtering. It's it's not a real, real uh, smart thing to do. If you use journal or kmsg, which is the default, it will usually get it right. We'll use kmsg if there is nothing else available. Otherwise, use the journal. Um, well, but the point is here, KMSG is really the only reliable thing for, for user space log messages during early boot. And also, while switching root uh, from initial run disk to, to, to the root file system while in the time where journal D isn't running. And that means, basically, if we need, if we really urgently need these messages that during that time, we have no other option than turning devprintk.fkmsg to on. On the other hand, uh, the kernel is uh, is implemented in the way that one, this can only be set at boot time. There is no way to change this option, and we don't want to have it on all the time to avoid nasty user space, uh, message, uh, space stuff to, to spam the kernel. So one idea that I'd like to discuss would be to uh, start boot uh, with a setting defk msg on and then to allow to reset this to the default rate limit setting a bit later. Sometime later after boot when the system is really up and, and k msg is not needed anymore for, for um, reliable message capturing. Okay, do I set channel UDF? Um, well, let's, UDEV logging is, a, is, is very special. UDEV is also part of the systemd suite, but um, yeah, recently uh, systemd has introduced uh, two so-called log rounds, one for UDEV, one for the rest. And um, strangely, um, well, UDEV, strangely, uh, not, not uh, the, the libUDEV library has uh, the log rounds, uh, System D set. That means if you uh, enable UDEV logging in a classical way, you will not um, affect the messages by logram UDEV. But that that is uh, changed by logram system D, and um, it, it's hard um, for for um, it will be influenced by system D environment variables if you are unlucky. So um, maybe a very minor point, but it's a, a um, Trip is something that you can easily fall in, so you have this uh, dash or underscore variant of, of the UDEF uh, uh, command line parameter. And I would use, recommend using dash here. Um, in recent versions of systemd also uh, interpret the underscore, but uh, you can easily get it uh, confused that. So by, by using the dash, you're on the safe side. I, I made this mistake, and uh, it, it's really... Okay, 
Finally, how to avoid using messages. So, um, well, be aware of, right, be aware of uh, write limits and uh, avoid the quiet and debug uh, parameters because uh, they are interpreted both by the kernel and systemd. Rather use something like log level or systemd.loglevel. Um, then the optimal settings would would depend on whether uh, the system is able to boot normally into fully operational state or not. In the first case, I, I would actually recommend to have um, uh, have Plymouth on. I mean, yeah, Sebastian's tip might also be a good a good one uh, to be able to to collect the status messages as well. Um, and the yeah, well, print k dot k that cave is g is nothing for production, but it's good for debugging and uh, in, increasing the log buffer uh, is also usually um, helpful. Uh, if the system does not boot correctly, or you need a serial console or a log console for other reasons, um, of course, it's, uh, the, the optimal settings are very different. It's good to disable Plymouth and uh, to redirect everything uh, to the consoler um, and to disable the status messages, which usually don't uh, help at all at this case. They just clutter the output. And uh, maybe it could be uh, reasonable to uh, enable forwarding to console for journal D. Um, it depends on what you what you want to look at. Okay, uh, thanks for your attention. That that was uh, all I want to say today. So I uh, took too much time. But if anybody has a question or remarks. Okay, doesn't seem to be the case, so thanks again. Bye-bye.